Welcome to excerpts from the Six Enneads by Plotinus Vegetarian. Beauty, part one of two, on Words of Wisdom. Plotinus Vegetarian was one of the most influential philosophers in antiquity, after Plato Vegetarian and Aristotle Vegetarian. In his philosophy, there are three principles the one, the intellect, and the soul. Historians of the 19th century invented the term Neoplatonism and applied it to Plotinus's philosophy. His metaphysical writings have inspired centuries of Islamic, Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic metaphysicians. The issue of happiness is one of Plotinus's greatest imprints on Western thought, as he was one of the first to introduce the idea that happiness is attainable only within consciousness. From all accounts, his personal and social life exhibited the highest moral and spiritual standards. He disliked talking about his own life, disapproved of meat, and refused medications containing animal substances. Plotinus's final words were, Try to raise the divine in yourselves to the divine in the all. Long before his physical departure from this world, the philosopher entrusted two of his closest disciples, Porphyry and Emilius, with the extensive task of collecting, revising, and compiling his writings. Thus, the Six Enneads was published to share Plotinus's precious insights with countless generations. It consists of 54 treaties, varied in length, arranged in six sets of nine Ennead, in three volumes. The Enneads are sorted by levels of sophistication, starting with the first Ennead, which emphasizes ethical topics. Today, we are delighted to present excerpts from the sixth tractate of the first Ennead, which expounds on beauty in our worldly lives and the secret of beauty deriving from our souls. The first Ennead, sixth tractate, Beauty, section one. Beauty addresses itself chiefly to sight, but there is a beauty for the hearing too, as in certain combinations of words and in all kinds of music, for melodies and cadences are beautiful. And minds that lift themselves above the realm of sense to a higher order are aware of beauty in the conduct of life, in actions, in character, in the pursuits of the intellect. And there is the beauty of the virtues. What loftier beauty there may be, yet our argument will bring to light. What then is it that gives comeliness to material forms and draws the ear to the sweetness perceived in sounds? And what is the secret of the beauty there is in all that derives from the soul? Is there one principle from which all take their grace? Or is there a beauty peculiar to the embodied and another for the bodiless? Finally, one or many, what would such a principle be? Consider that some things, material shapes for instance, are gracious not by anything inherent, but by something communicated, while others are lovely of themselves, as, for example, virtue. The same bodies appear sometimes beautiful, sometimes not, so that there is a good deal between being body and being beautiful. What then is this something that shows itself in certain material forms? This is the natural beginning of our inquiry. What is it that attracts the eyes of those to whom a beautiful object is presented and calls them, lures them towards it, and fills them with joy at the sight. If we possess ourselves of this, we have at once a standpoint for the wider survey. 
Almost everyone declares that the symmetry of parts towards each other and towards a whole, with, besides, a certain charm of color, constitutes the beauty recognized by the eye. That in visible things, as indeed in all else, universally, the beautiful thing is essentially symmetrical, patterned. But think what this means. Only a compound can be beautiful, never anything devoid of parts, and only a whole. The several parts will have beauty not in themselves, but only as working together to give a comely total. Yet beauty in an aggregate demands beauty in details. It cannot be constructed out of ugliness. Its law must run throughout. All the loveliness of color and even the light of the sun, being devoid of parts and so not beautiful by symmetry, must be ruled out of the realm of beauty. And how comes gold to be a beautiful thing? And lightning by night and the stars, why are these so fair? Again, since the one face, constant in symmetry, appears sometimes fair and sometimes not, can we doubt that beauty is something more than symmetry? That symmetry itself owes its beauty to a remoter principle? Turn to what is attractive in methods of life, or in the expression of thought. Are we to call in symmetry here? What symmetry is to be found in noble conduct, or excellent laws, in any form of mental pursuit? What symmetry can there be in points of abstract thought? The symmetry of being accordant with each other. But there may be accordance or entire identity where there is nothing but ugliness. The proposition that honesty is merely a generous artlessness chimes in the most perfect harmony with the proposition that morality means weakness of will. The accordance is complete. Then again, all the virtues are a beauty of the soul, a beauty authentic beyond any of these others. But how does symmetry enter here? The soul, it is true, is not a simple unity, but still, its virtue cannot have the symmetry of size or of number. What standard of measurement could preside over the compromise or the coalescence of the soul's faculties or purposes? Finally, how, by this theory, would there be beauty in the intellectual principle, essentially the solitary? Section 2 Let us then go back to the source and indicate at once the principle that bestows beauty on material things. Undoubtedly this principle exists. It is something that is perceived at first glance, something which the soul names as from an ancient knowledge and, recognizing, welcomes it, enters into unison with it. Our interpretation is that the soul, by the very truth of its nature, by its affiliation to the noblest existence in the hierarchy of being, when it sees anything of that kin or any trace of that kinship, thrills with an immediate delight, takes its own to itself, and thus stirs anew to the sense of its nature and of all its affinity. But is there any such likeness between the loveliness of this world and the splendors in the Supreme? Such a likeness in the particulars would make the two orders alike. But what is there in common between beauty here and beauty there? And on what has thus been compacted to unity, beauty enthrones itself, giving itself to the parts as to the sum. When it lights on some natural unity, a thing of like parts, then it gives itself to that whole. Thus, for an illustration, there is the beauty conferred by craftsmanship of all a house with all its parts, and the beauty which some natural quality may give to a single stone. This, then, is how the material thing becomes beautiful, by communicating in the thought that flows from the divine. For more information, please visit sacred-texts.com.
Don't attack nations. Don't attack people. Attack war instead. Luminous viewers, thank you for watching today's Words of Wisdom.